Hello and welcome back to Catch and Cook California. I'm Kevin. Happy New Year. Today is video number three in my new series, Introduction to Freediving and Spearfishing California. Today we're specifically going to focus on diving for sea urchin, which are one of the most abundant and sustainable native resources that you can pursue. In order to talk about how to dive for sea urchin and the sustainability of that harvest, we have to talk about the relationship between sea urchin, sea stars, and our kelp bed ecosystems. So let's jump on in. Well folks, I know it has been a long time since I posted a video. That's not because I have not been doing anything. As a matter of fact, I'm sitting on six videos right now. I just don't have time to edit. And the reason I don't have time to edit is I've been taking folks like you out on all kinds of adventures. In order to discuss the sustainability of a harvest of sea urchin in California, I want to show you some footage way, way, way back when. I'm talking over 10 years ago. The footage is old and grainy, but it shows what the kelp bed ecosystem used to look like. I want to show you that first in contrast to what the ocean looks like today. I grew up freediving for California red abalone on the Sonoma coast. Back then, if you approached the edge of the bluff and looked out on the water, you'd see all kinds of texture. That texture you can see in this old footage is actually the kelp fronds, the actual canopy of a healthy bull kelp forest. In this old footage, you can see me kind of rearranging my board, rearranging the abalone to talk about how I dive for abalone. But in the background, you can see a close-up of that abundant, healthy bull kelp forest. Here's some old footage from my brother's old channel. He's ascending from 50 feet, and you can see, as he comes towards the surface, that abundant bull kelp canopy. Here's some more shots from his old channel. This is me trying to make my way through the abundant bull kelp stocks with a stringer of rockfish and lingcod. This is just how it was back then. You'd dive to the bottom and you had to kind of weave your way through. And this is how it always was growing up. See here as I try to make my way to the surface for a breath, I even have to pick a spot among the kelp to get that breath. California kelp beds are dominated by two main species of large kelp. From Baja to the central California coast, our kelp beds are dominated by giant kelp this species here. And a friendly little harbor seal. Hey buddy. From the central coast up to Alaska, our kelp forests are dominated by bull kelp. That is this species here. Bull kelp and giant kelp reproduce in different ways. Because of the way that bull kelp reproduces, it dies back each year. But before it dies back, it drops its spores to the reef below. If those spores fall onto a reef absolutely covered in purple urchin, those sprouts never even get a chance to grow. This is an image from Ocean Cove, which is on the Sonoma coast and where I grew up learning how to dive for abalone, how to spearfish, and how to coastal forage. Only a few years later, this image was taken from the exact same spot. Notice how the once abundant kelp forest is now completely absent. That is not good. Here's some old footage of an old sea star. This is coming from my old channel. And we can see abundant kelp underwater, but hang on, wait a minute, let's go back and look at that weird sea star. This is a sunflower star. And it turns out that this particular species of sea star is what we refer to as a keystone predator. We used to see these on every dive. If you look behind this beautiful green anemone, you can see a small one kind of poking out. These sunflower stars are actually the main predator of the purple sea urchin. Once abundant along our coasts, we used to see them, as I said, on every dive. But starting in 2013, and then really becoming intensified 2015 and 2016, a warm water event known as the Warm Blob kept warm waters on the Sonoma coast and up through Alaska. Years and years of unprecedented warm water off of our coast led to the spread of sea star wasting syndrome. This disease decimated over 20 species of sea star and most specifically led to the local extinction of sunflower stars. With no sunflower stars to eat sea urchins, the purple sea urchin population has exploded. 
and our once abundant and healthy kelp bed ecosystems have transitioned into this, purple undersea deserts, which we refer to as urchin barrens. And while their populations have been kept in check by sunflower stars for thousands upon thousands of years, with no natural predator around to keep them in check, even though they are native, they are now acting like an invasive species. It's not just a matter of losing the kelp, but all of the entities that live on, survive by eating, and hide within the kelp forests. These are red abalone, and these abalone are in their natural habitat on rocks surrounded by kelp. Now many of us have heard that abalone season was closed due to overfishing. That is simply not the case. An emergency closure of the California red abalone season was put into effect largely due to the fact that abalone have run out of food. There's simply not enough seaweed as a result of the overpopulation of sea urchins. Here is a California red abalone engaged in very abnormal behavior, crawling up a dead kelp stalk to try to get nori adhering to that dead kelp stalk. Here, tegula try to do the same thing. They're just trying to get off the reef to find anything to eat. Red abalone hate to be on sand, and yet here's an abalone crossing sand, which urchins do not like to cross. These abalone out on the sand are incredibly vulnerable to predation, but they will do what they can to find a small rock as a refuge in order to find any food at all. Notice all of these abs on one rock with no food, and notice all of those empty shells. I'm seeing more empty abalone shells than I've ever seen before on the California coast. Abalone are starving to death. They have no food. The loss of kelp does not just affect the red abalone, it also affects the fish. Here a sculpin has no place to hide on the reef. Normally it would blend into the kelp forest. A healthy kelp bed ecosystem provides all kinds of habitat. Here you can see abundant juvenile perch, but rockfish, lingcod, cabazon, all of these species that we have come to love rely on the kelp forests for habitat, for rookeries. The same goes for sea mammals and seabirds. Without the kelp forests, our ocean is in trouble. Now I know up to this point this video has been pretty depressing, but I really wanted to show you this because this is what I've seen in my lifetime of diving the California coast, and I need you to see it, because we need to step up and do something. Now here's the deal, I don't want to make just a depressing video, I want this to be motivational. All of us can do our part, and we can do a number of different things to make it better. And in one thing that we can do is have a lot of fun by jumping in the water or waiting for a low tide and going foraging for purple sea urchin. This is the only resource that I know of on the California coast that is a native species where when you take it, you're actually having a positive impact on the environment. First things first, you need rocky reef. So you see me here, I'm taking out my snorkel, I've cleared my ears at the surface, and then I clear my ears every few feet all the way down. That way my eustachian tubes are open and my ears do not hurt. As you can see, I don't really use any tools for purple urchin. For red urchin, sometimes I'll use an abalone pry bar. I definitely recommend getting one of those and I'll leave a link in the description. Those pry bars are, are useful for big urchin that are hard to get or urchins that are back in caves, but they're also useful for scallops, which are one of my all-time favorite local foods. But yeah, for the most part, these urchins are sharp, but they're not super sharp, so if you have regular dive gloves, you should be just fine. You'll even notice that in these clips I think I have holes in my glove, and it's still not a problem. I just swim along and look for an urchin that's of a decent size, and then I'll pull it off the reef, and then I crack a few of them open just to make sure that they actually have a good yield of uni, uh, the reproductive organ, which is the part of the sea urchin that we eat. And if it looks good and healthy, nice and yellow to yellow-orange, then I'll gather up a number of those off of that rock. If you open a sea urchin and it's brown, or if you open that sea urchin and it's empty, that means the rest of those urchins on that particular rock are probably going to be brown or empty as well. So you might want to swim to another rock. So here I am clearing my mask. I just put a little pressure on top of my mask and I breathe out through my nose and that clears any water that might start to leak into your mask. It's something that all divers should know how to do and you'll have to do it on every single time you go out at some point. I was following this black rockfish to get some footage and check that out. Got visited by a mermaid. Dude, that was awesome. <laughs> Beautiful. There's a female sea lion. 
So I was joined this day by my good buddy Dez. Here he is getting his first sea urchin. And you can see it's not really that difficult to do. This is one of the things I love most about sea urchin diving is even though you're making a positive impact, it does not take years and years and years to get 50 feet down or something crazy like that. In fact, as soon as you swim offshore, you'll be finding these in like six feet of water. So here's Dez loading up his three prong and bam, nice shot, buddy. Again, those cheap fiberglass three prongs are absolutely worth the money. Something like 40 bucks and you can be out there spearfishing. If you haven't seen our last two videos, I'll leave links right here. But both of those show just how effective these can be. It's the purple sea urchin that's the problem species. But I had to grab a couple of reds as well. I just couldn't help myself. Not to mention, I needed one of these to make a bowl to serve my sea urchin salsa. See the close-up of a California red abalone and note all that purple in the background. These anemones are actually carnivorous. A lot of people don't know that. They're very beautiful. But if you throw something in them, they will chow down on it. <laughs> so there you go. Urchins going back into the food chain. Now, because these videos are meant to teach you how to kind of get into local freediving and spearfishing on the California coast, I do want to emphasize safety. One thing to keep in mind is because you will be in abundant sea urchin in very shallow water, very close to the shore. That's actually where the waves are most intense. The shallower the water, the more the swell is going to start to crest as a wave and the more likely you can get caught in that and get thrown up against the rocks. This means that it's extremely important when you swim out to constantly be popping your head out and looking out at the water, seeing what is coming towards you. The daily bag limit for purple sea urchin and red sea urchin is still 35 individuals per day if you are foraging. On the Sonoma, Mendocino, and Humboldt coasts, you are allowed 40 gallons of purple sea urchin, but only if you are free diving or scuba diving. Remember, it would still be a 35 individual limit if you are foraging. Eventually, I loaded up the last of my sea urchin catch, put my pole spear back on my board, and started to coil up my float line. <laughs> and I think this is the perfect example of how ferocious the appetite is on these purple sea urchins. As I bring up my abalone pry bar, which I use as a weight to mark spots on the end of my float line, you can see it's already got sea urchins stuck to it. And then I pick a location where it's safe to swim in. You'll notice that I'll be watching the shore and then watching the open water. That's because I'm timing it to make sure that I don't get rolled in by a big wave. Now this area, when you're right in here in the surf zone, is the most dangerous spot you can be. You'll notice right here, the first thing that I do is try to get my fins off as fast as possible. This is extremely important because you're not going to swim when you're this shallow and you're not going to be able to walk if you've got your fins on. You'll also notice that the rubber cover on the tip of my three prong just came off. So here I use the fins kind of as a shield. Then I pin down my board. It's very important to pin down your gear. You do not let go of anything in the white water that you don't want to lose. By pinning it down, I can let a swell come in, slam my gear, and I don't lose anything. The next thing I do is lift my gear up, wait for the next swell to come through, and then I'll just start moving my way up out of the inner tidal onto some dry rocks. Once I'm high enough, I'll take my fins and I'll actually slip them underneath my goodie bag to keep everything secured. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to head right back down to help my dive buddy make sure I can get any kind of gear from them to make it easier. So here Des is handing me the pole spear so that he can take his fins off. I'm telling you, it doesn't seem like much, but you want to get those fins off as fast as possible. Otherwise, you're just going to get rolled over and over again. And on a day like this, it might just be kind of funny to get rolled in the surf. Other days, it can be actually very dangerous. So trying to get out of that surf zone as fast as possible and keeping all of your gear in your hand. Those are my tips for beginner divers. Don't leave home without it. <laughs> That's what the inside of its mouth looks like. Something out of a horror film. And then in here, we have the uni. Get yourself a nice rusty knife. Get in there, in the out. Put it on your dive board. Open it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> That'll do it. Right in there. Make sure you don't have any sea urchin spines on it. Yeah, go right in, man. Yeah. 
Yeah. I got the oil heating up here. Um, I had to kind of barricade myself in. I got a bag over here, a bag over here, the Pelican ice chest, and I've got my tortillas cut and ready to go. That's how fresh it is. He's dead, but he's still moving. All right, the last part. Got to put the uni on there. All right, this is how I had it served in Baja. Capitan Jorge. He was a Punga driver, captain, great, great fisherman. He stopped off and gave one of our fish some urchin divers, they gave him sea urchin, he cracked it open, mixed salsa in, and served it to us right there while it was still moving. Mm. Mm. Big old hunk of sea urchin in there. Mm. Mm. That is delicious. It adds a creaminess, almost like if you were to drizzle a little crema over your pico de gallo. It's got a sweetness from the sea and a slight umami. So it gives a richness and, and this kind of buttery creaminess to an otherwise kind of spicy and citrusy and very fresh salsa. It's fantastic. Anyway, I'm going to finish this up. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you learned a little bit about freediving. Please like, subscribe, comment. I love hearing back from you. And until next time, keep the old ways alive. Join us next time as we go foraging for a lion's mane fungus. And I'm going to teach you how to freedive Southern California for Pacific rock scallops. We're going to pair those together for a one-of-a-kind scallop and mushroom pasta. In the meantime, the rain has been dumping and this mushroom season has been exquisite. So if you're interested in getting outside in the Bay Area and learning what this season can provide, learning how to identify wild, edible, and incredible mushrooms, hit me up. It will dye your hands though. <laughs> I was like breathing in water because my snorkel was like not airtight. I had water in my mask and fog and I was tangled up in your rope. I kept on <laughs> It took me five minutes to not get tangled up in your rope. You know, it was like every which way it could be. He speared his fish and you guys asked for some gear reviews. Do not buy this float line. <laughs> this thing was cheap, but it is just like, it'll tangle you up. When I finally thought I was free, it just like was all over my snorkel, my head, my shoulder. I was like, I'm free. And it's like, no, it's through my legs. <laughs>